South Wales Rural Fire Service. My name is Gary Cooper, Fire Mitigation Officer, Far South Coast Team. Today's presentation is to give you a fire awareness of how African lovegrass behaves during fire conditions. African lovegrass is a drought tolerant perennial grass introduced in the country as a source of fodder and is thriving in the Bega Valley on the low fertile sandy soils. Today's presentation will touch on firefighter awareness and situational awareness and firefighter safety. Fire behaviour will go into looking at what makes up the fuel on lovegrass, what um, connectivity of the fuel and how to control these lovegrass fires. During this presentation we'll introduce you to Rick Jennings from Department of Primary Industries Rick will demonstrate and explain to you how lovegrass fuels and fuel loads affect fire behaviour. African lovegrass is a hardy, drought tolerant perennial grass introduced from Africa in the early 1900s, which thrives on sandy soils with low fertility. It's a very fast growing weed with prolific growth during the frost three months. During the months that incur frosts, African lovegrass cures to about 80%. This is where it is most volatile, especially in July through to October, where high winds, dry cured fuels make ideal fire conditions. Due to the cured conditions, African lovegrass, humidity is not an underlying factor, as its fire behaviour will be demonstrated in this presentation. Uh, I've worked for the Department of Primary Industries for uh, over 30 years now and uh, basically doing trial work and pastures and I expect to grow in, in a trial situation somewhere between 20 and 25 tonnes of dry matter per hectare in a year. Here we're dealing with uh, 35 tonnes and uh, possibly up to 40 plus tonnes in some areas around here. Um, a good crop of corn uh, would I would expect somewhere between 20 and 30 tonnes of dry matter per year. The difference here is this has been allowed to build up over a fair period of time. You could be looking at three, four or five years um, and, it, and the fuel load hasn't been taking away, taken away. So uh, that's why we're dealing with such heavy loads here. Fuel loading here, even though we're talking absolute fuel loads of you know, 35 tonnes, the scary thing about this stuff is the fuel connectivity and that means all this fuel here is connected. You'll see it broken up into little bits, right, which slows the fire down. As we get further up the hill, there's more connectivity between the fuel and that will tear straight through that. Here, it'll slow down because you've got, even though you've got large fuel loads here, for example, you've got nothing beside it, so it'll certainly slow down here. But don't rely on this to bloody pull a fire up, it just won't happen. Hey, look, uh, this is a patch uh, that was burnt here uh, several weeks ago. And as you can see, these, these lovegrass plants are all coming back beautifully. There is some native pasture in amongst this, uh, but we'll very quickly get out competed uh, during the summer months by this African lovegrass. This will be back, within 12 months this will be back as thick as whatever it was. with it, uh, very fine stem, very fine material, very dry and very dense and uh, if I move back through this you'll certainly see buddy, an indication of what we're dealing with when it comes to lovegrass fires. Okay, as you can see, look, it's going to go not too wet by any means, so it's, it's going to go here tonight. Uh, from a single point of ignition, it's going to start moving pretty well. So we've, we've got some weather readings here. And 
using a couple of different lighting patterns. Straight away you can see a little spot in the front of that. Now it's already starting to create its own heat. See where the slash has been up here and put all this material on the ground. It's still rated at 30 to 35 tonnes of dry matter per hectare, except that we've changed the layout of the fuel. Instead of being this high and, and vertically, okay, all it's done is laid it out on the ground. So you've still got the same total amount of fuel. It's just it's distributed a different way. So we're not going to, out here, we're not going to find the same heat intensity or flame height, but you've still got a vast amount of fuel laying on the ground after the slash has been through. Well, we're just going to light it down here in spots, about every three, four, five metres. Yep. Right. Simply just dropping a spot of... Yep. Rather than a continuous line. When yep. we get down the bottom, I'll change it into a continuous line. Okay. And you'll get some idea of, of the different lighting patterns and how fast they react. Okay, just the drop. That's it. That's, that's all we it. want. Okay, come down here. Yeah. Keep coming down. Okay, another one in here. Right, that's it. Another one here. Like I can't with you, do you? Down low. Yeah, probably yeah. Okay, let's just stand back and have a look and see what this does. This line here, this fire is almost self-extinguished. Just relating back to what I was talking about earlier with fuel connectivity. It's not a continuous fuel load along this line and it's almost gone out. It will creep through, but as you can see it's almost self-extinguished. Unlike further down where it's a continuous fuel line, that will just keep continuing to burn in a, in a wall of flame. Why Rick's going through the lighting patterns here, because of our wind direction which we can see with the smoke at the moment, we need to keep at least 10, 20 metres on this flank in front of that vehicle down on the bottom, the bottom flank, if you can see down there, James. Reason being is that we don't want the vehicle that's lighting up on that bottom flank to overtake us and come roaring up the hill. So always keep an eye on your wind direction and keep 10, 10 20, 30 metres maybe in front of that crew there. It's all to do with communication and, and work. It gets fairly intense fairly quickly and it'll move away from you, okay? Yep. So you're out here in the clear area, radiant heat moves away from you, yep. temperatures drop because you're out here. We'll go in here in a minute and do a, a light it up five metres in and mm -hmm. come out here and you'll see the difference. You'll have a wall of flame moving towards you and also one away. Yeah. I'm just going to yeah, walk up this inside. Keep walking up here. No, Remember, we've got the wind coming in from this direction. Flame should be going away from us. Yep, it's behind us. But if you've yep. got people out there, yeah, it's, it's going to put them under pressure. Towards. It's going yeah. to put them under a lot of pressure. Right, I keep it coming up. No easy, man. I'm walking backwards. <laughs> Watch out for the combat Okay, holes. so you can you can actually feel how difficult it's becoming to walk yeah. through this stuff. Okay, let's. Even though the wind is coming from behind us, all this side flank is pulling in because the convection column is going straight up. Really wide bloody flame front, still burning at the back edge. That fire front right up in there running over the top over that light fuel and it slowly burns down. Radiant heat's pretty good at the moment, isn't it? See there's a mat when it when you burn with the wind, you get this massive bloody 
massive bloody uh, hot area through here. Whereas if you get a backing fire, yeah. you get a fairly narrow flame front. get through a lot of these jobs without any water at all. And don't be afraid to use brake hose. I know they're like a black snake, but it's not hard to stop a tyre like this by raking his fingers. It's really from Burger South One. Yeah, go ahead, Burger South One. Uh, are you ready for this uh, weather reading? Over. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, weather reading for this next burn is temperature 13 degrees, relative humidity 72%, copy so far. Yeah, copy so far. Wind speed is 2.5 kilometres, uh, wind direction easterly, wind direction over. Yeah, copy that. Uh, anything further? Uh, nothing further, be the south one clear. Okay, so we're on site here out on the property at Cantalow that was, that was burnt um, last August, September. Um, as you can see, um, after that property was burnt, it's been sown with a crop and managed intensively uh, by grazing. And it appears that looks like they've um, got plans here to, to spray this property out again and sow another pasture, um, hence being intensively managed and there's very little love grass left on the property. Comparison across the fence line, um, not as much intensive management and we've got quite a bit of love grass still prominent. Hence well, the reason why we're trying to explain that the more intensively managed the properties are with uh, pasture improvement, um, the less fuel we've got with love grass, um, giving us a lot more of a chance to, to combat fires in this sort of country. Yeah.
Um, we've got a lovegrass specimen here that's um, obviously been sprayed out. Uh, it hasn't totally killed the plant and it's come back up quite short and the cattle have been grazing it. While it's in its, in its short status, the cattle will graze on it, but once it gets tall and rank, um, the livestock won't, won't touch it. Um, and while it's in that state, it's not an issue to us, but once it gets long and rank and it gets dried or cured by frosts later in the season, uh, that's where the lovegrass becomes a problem. Um, we've got a slope of about 15 degrees running uphill to an asset sitting at the top of the hill. Um, a prime example of uh, having a good managed asset protection zone around this asset, given a fire escaping on a bad day in dry lovegrass, um, we wouldn't get a chance to get brigades to this asset in time before the fire was impacting. So we need to try and supply a good 20 or 30 metre break of between the lovegrass and the asset to be able to have an achievable area that we can defend that property. If we haven't got that area prepared, we're going to have no chance of defending this dwelling. You can see a paddock which is predominantly lovegrass, I would say probably 80, 90% lovegrass, but it's been continually managed by slashing. There's been no pasture improvement done at all, but with the management of slashing on a large scale has given us a quite a large paddock with, with not a lot of fuel. Um, and it's formed quite a park-like environment, but Obviously there's some significant costs involved in uh, trying to manage a, a property like this uh, using uh, mechanical means um, and this would have to be done on a regular basis and by the look of this property it's probably done four or five times a year. Here we are in another paddock of lovegrass only about um, 100 metres, 200 metres down the road from that last managed land that we just looked at. As you can see uh, we've got three, three foot of good healthy growth. As you can see Underneath the layer here we've got the duff layer. Well this is obviously a sign that this property was slashed and I know for a fact that six months ago this was, um, this was slashed totally this block. Um, so there was not, a, not an ounce of growth on it other than what was um, underneath the slashed ground. This is what's going to cause us a major problem later on in uh, winter after we come out of the autumn period which we're in now and we get a lot of that heavy frost and by September this paddock will be getting up to that 80-90% cured and it's going to be a major issue if this paddock doesn't get slashed. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fuel here and it's going to be a major fire problem. As you can see off in the distance we've got a nice new residence um, and a lot of mechanical works has happened around that property giving that a, a really good asset protection zone. Um, what he needs to do is obviously maintain that and, and continually maintain that to be able to have an area around his house that's going to be defendable if, if a fire breaks out in this country right next door. Okay, as you've seen in the last, uh, last few minutes of footage, we've shown you the number of different methods of uh, managing and maintaining lovegrass to avoid it being a major fire hazard. Our number one priority was um, the managed land where we had sprayed out paddocks which had been burnt and pasture improved and over a continual period of time that'll be the most cost effective and best method for managing lovegrass. We stepped into a paddock then that had been just continually slashed and it had not been pasture improved but it continually slashed had kept the fuel down. And as you can see where we are again now, we're in another paddock, um, obviously it's been slashed but we still do have a lot of dry matter and fuel on the ground and hence the reason behind that is it's been left too long between slashings. We're still going to have a lot of fuel, but the connectivity of the fuel as we've spoken about previously in the video has been minimised because it's now, it's now more condensed and it's laying on the ground and this material will then rot and go back into the soil. So we've got a number of management practices that we'd like to, like to utilise, um, all of which are going to be effective in, in managing lovegrass and limiting the amount of effect it's going to have under fire conditions.